Hello, everyone. My name is Silvia Cardona, and I'm at the University of Manitoba. I'm going to start showing this very simple cartoon of bacteria. And as you can see, they all look alike, right? And that's how we think about bacteria, especially when we work as microbiologists with pure cultures, one species, they all look alike. But if you sequence the genomes, you will see that they're not, because they accumulate mutations all the time, right? So that's why when you get an infection and the infection is treated with an antibiotic, then most of them probably will die. The antibiotic will be effective. But maybe some that accumulated some mutations will not, and this guy will prevail and will turn into an antibiotic-resistant infection. And that's what happens. So that makes us microbiologists to be working all the time in antibiotic discovery. And here I'm showing you a basic pipeline of antibiotic discovery that starts with the primary screening, which is testing many, many, many compounds against bacteria to see which ones are active, which ones are not. And that's the primary screening. And, if, and the ones that are active are called HITs. But this is just the very beginning, because after you find a HIT, then you have to keep going. Is the compound uh, toxic to humans? Uh, also, you have to find what is the mechanism of action, what is the target of that compound, and based on the chemical structure of the compound, it will bind a cellular component of the cell inhibiting its function, and that's why it will inhibit growth, right? So, and then you may find yourself that you need more of that compound, and then you will need chemists to synthesize that chemical compound to keep going. But that's not the end then you have a lead from heat to lead, but then you have to go to the steps of lead optimization where it involves more experiments, now looking to see if the compound is bioavailable, that is, does it reach the site of infection? So more experiments, and usually those involve more synthesis, more computational designs to make the compound more potent, and finally, you can call that compound an antibiotic candidate that is ready to go into clinical trials. So you may think that this is a very smart procedure, very sophisticated. Let me tell you something. It's not. It's long, and it's really difficult to go on with it. So this is some of the reasons why I'm saying it's not a very smart procedure. Success rate is too low. So only one out of 10 million compounds, maybe, maybe, has the chance to be converted into an antibiotic. It can take 10 to 20 years to get one of these compounds to the market. If you compare with the uh, rise of antibacterial resistance, that's not going to make the case. It's not going to solve the problem. And the costs of antibiotic discovery and development are really high, like more than $5 million. So, so really, this is not acceptable. We're in the middle of ASM micro, and still we cannot figure out this problem. Give me a break. We have to do something, right? So that's why artificial intelligence can come to the rescue. And people are talking a lot about artificial intelligence nowadays. But let me tell you something. It's nothing different from us. Actually, artificial intelligence is made mimicking human intelligence. It's human intelligence in the form of a computer. So you're looking at me, right? And you're thinking, oh, do I like this presentation? Maybe yes, maybe not. Do I know that face? Maybe I know that person from some other, and you're comparing with your memory. What do you have? Do I know that individual? And making predictions. Yeah, actually, I think I know that person. Or maybe I don't. You're making predictions all the time. Same with artificial intelligence. You feed computer modules with data, 
and the computer model will learn from that data to make predictions. Now, what if we could use all the chemical structures that have been assessed for antimicrobial activity, whether they are active or no active, and feed a computer model so that the computer model can predict which molecules have a higher chance of being active and being effective antibiotics and which ones do not. So the question I'm asking here is, can we predict antimicrobial activity if we only know the chemical structure of the molecules? And let me show you what we are doing in my lab, our approach, and it's split in three parts. We gather data, we either produce or look at data that other people have produced, we train the computer, and then we predict. So gathering data is about taking thousands of chemical molecules that have been addressed for antimicrobial activity or doing it ourselves in the lab with wild type bacteria that are pathogens, we test them against thousands of molecules. The other part of the data is working with genomic libraries of mutants. Uh, those are made so that each of the genes of the genome is mutated with different techniques and the libraries are representative of the whole genome. And then you can expose them to antibiotics and as in nature, some genes confer resistance to the drugs, some genes may, when mutated, may confer hypersusceptibility. So by looking at these interactions is how we can figure out how the antibiotics or the new molecules with antibiotic activity work. So the second part is to train the computers. And how do we do that? We feed the computers with all the data and we ask the computer to tell us their predictions. And then we evaluate the performance of the predictions with some part of the data set. But this is not the end because once, once the computer model has achieved the performance that we uh, wanted to achieve, then we use virtual libraries of chemical molecules and ask the computer model, can you tell me which ones are active, which ones could be antibiotics and which ones could not? And when I'm telling about these virtual libraries, these are not the chemical molecules themselves. These are the structural, the, the chemical structures in a file described in a language that a computer can understand. That's what we, feel that we ask the computer to do. So let me show you one of our AI predicted small molecules that we have experimentally validated in the lab. Because no computer model is perfect. So you always have to validate the predictions. In this case, we took this compound that was predicted to be active by our artificial intelligence uh, model. We purchased the compound, we tested the activity in the lab, and yes, it was active against many bacterial pathogens. And we took one step further and asked all our bacterial mutant libraries which ones of those were more sensitive to this drug just to uh, find out what is the mechanism of action. And what we found is that this compound maybe is involved in inhibiting protein synthesis, one of the essential functions of the bacterial cell. And I'll let you um, know a little bit more. In particular, this compound may inhibit an enzyme called peptidyl tRNA hydrolase. And this is a very important enzyme that kind of rescue stole ribosomes with peptides that are not good. It cuts, it cuts the peptide out and, and rescue the ribosome for continuing to protein synthesis. So let me now take you to the take home message of this talk. Artificial intelligence is a great method to predict compounds that have 
a greater chance of success when tested in the lab. But it doesn't replace experimental validation. By pets, um, experiments will be always needed because predictions are predictions. They may have a greater chance to be right, but still you need to validate them. And, and what is nice is that maybe with this approach, we don't need to test so many compounds. We're not talking about 10 million compounds now. We may be talking about a few hundreds, and that's doable in any lab. And if we uh, do these processes and we get help with artificial intelligence in different steps of antibiotic discovery, maybe we can solve the crisis of antimicrobial resistance. Thank you very much for listening.